speaking in English or just Irish? It's Irish and Spanish. Yeah, no, it's Spanish part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Testing, testing. Sir? How do I pass you in next slide? Um, There's supposed to be a clicker, but for now, it's a Welcome to Campus Party 2013. This is the Galileo stage where you'll be given different talks and see different exhibitions on robotics, astronomy, modding, nanotech, and cybertech. This morning, this morning we have Lucio Campbell. Lucio Campbell is from Spain with Irish heritage and he'll be giving you a talk on modding and the effects steampunk has had on modding. Ladies and gentlemen, can we get a round of applause for Lucio Campbell? Cheers. Morning, guys. Um, is everyone as tired as I am? Or 
Okay, I'll figure this out. All right, well, basically, today I'm going to talk to you about steampunk and modding. Um, for example, last year in, in Berlin, there was a talk about steampunk in general and whatnot. Uh, the guys were wearing outfits. As you can see, I'm not wearing an outfit. But basically, what I want to show you today is the different effects and how you can achieve uh, a steampunk look on your project. Now, steampunk, it's, it's asking what is it is a very hard question to, to reply. Mostly because there's no, there's no specific gen, there's, there's, no, there's no specific answer. Everybody has their own opinion about what is it or not. So basically, you're going to forgive me, I'm going to read this. I've compiled a bit of a few points that I think explain very well what steampunk is. Steampunk has always been, first and foremost, a literary gen or at least a subgenre of science fiction and fantasy that includes social or technological aspects of the 19th century. This theme, usually with some deconstruction of, reimagining of, of rebellion against parts of it, the punk. Unfortunately, it is a poorly defined subgenre with plenty of disagreement about what it is and what is and what is not included. For example, steampunk stories may include taking place in the Victorian area, but include advanced machines based on, on late 19th century. They include, they sometimes they can even include the supernatural, be it magic, advanced science, alchemy, that kind of thing. They include advanced machines in today's day, the human petrol and other fuels were never existed. So we get a bit of a, a weird industrial era. I mean, we get the whole machines building other machines, but we don't get the efficiency that fuel and other, uh, the petrol and other advanced fuels are given us today, combustion, engines, that kind of thing. It's a sort of... Yeah, I think that the right word would be Victorian industrial. And there are probably plenty of other combinations. That steampunk has in a general natural. Steampunk is also a cross-pollinated in its way to other, into other genres. So there's a steampunk, a steampunk romance, steampunk erotica even, and steampunk young adult fiction, mostly seen in books rather than images or movies and that kind of thing. Now, you can actually find steampunk in, in games, like I'm sure you've all heard of Bioshock, you've all heard of uh, Dishonored. You find it in movies like Mutual Chronicles, or most, most recently the Sherlock Holmes saga. In some cases, more obvious than others, you get the whole Victorian era with the whole advanced machinery, little gun coming out of here with clockwork. In other, in other, uh, in other scenes, it's less obvious, you get wooden and copper backgrounds, you get designs that will only appear in that area. <clears throat> Stepan has become actually a lot more as well. With uh, all cool contraptions in the stories, in movies, it was very natural that some people that design have ideas that will come up, hey, I've seen that in a movie, I know it's technologically impossible, but I don't know, I'm going to go to a convention, I want to have something that looks like it. So you'll find a lot of... Um, People dressed up in the favorite characters, be it anime, manga, movies, games. Uh, you see Big Daddy from, from uh, Bioshock, you know, massive outfit. And the guys, the guys design this at home, whether it's done it professionally or, or in, a, in a mature fashion. They still have to build it and they still have to ha research how to do it on the internet. And that's where this whole steampunk thing comes in. It's also a way of, but even if it's not functional, it's a way of saying, I've been able to build this without the need of an industrial area, a, a manufacturing production, that kind of thing. The aesthetics also carry on to personal style. And nowadays, we see a lot of clothing, a lot of, um, well, a lot of corsets, a lot of uh, fancy clothing with all sorts of details. And it's not just the whole Victorian look, which it is. They also have contraptions that you might find Tesla coils, for example. The whole the very little electricity that you may find in, in steampunk design is normally carried out by Tesla coils. Um, you could almost say that steampunk in terms of clothing is gothic guys that have found the color brown, right? Now, <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you about steampunk and modding. Now, this is, a, this is an example of a mod. Uh, basically using liquid cooling with copper piping and whatnot. There's, there's a lot of different versions, but I'm going to talk you on how, not precisely how to do it as a guide as such, but to give you an idea of whether if you were interested in starting and doing your own, you wouldn't find yourself in a situation where, where the hell do I start kind of thing. So for example, we have the whole fake or real question. Because steampunk uses a lot of copper, brass, wood, you might find yourself thinking, okay, well, I want to make my computer out of wood, but that's just not practical. I mean, you've got the cooling concerns, it's gonna heat up. 
uh, you got ventilation concerns. You also have the problem of like if you want to cut wood, when you make a mistake, there's no going back. So if in fact, if if, if you cut uh, met, sheet metal, you can always solder back on a plate. You can continue. There's always ways to correct it. So I'm going to show you here a process of how it's been turned to wood just using a simple vinyl. Now these vinyls you can buy in any DIY shop. You can use a, a wood paper. You can use a, um, a, wait, wait, wood paper. Yeah, basically wallpaper that has a, the pattern on it. But it can either be white, it's not actually meant to be wood, but if you give it a proper paint job, it would. In this case, we have a, a simple, might I add a bit ugly, wood vinyl, cheap. You can buy it in any DIY shop. Now, once you apply it to the surface you want, you can start doing aging effects. Aging effects I will explain later on, but are a lot simpler than the sound. You can add detailing with the brass, copper, and it's still like at the end of the day, it's all about detailing for the sake of detailing. The more you put, the more it's going to look like the part. Here we see the actual product finished. I mean, it looks pretty much like aged wood. And deep inside, it, it's just literally a vinyl over a piece of metal. You don't always need a vinyl. With the right inks and paints, you can just paint on, on a straight surface and find, for example, this fan hasn't got a vinyl on. But with the right strokes with the brush, you can just as easily make that wood effect. Remember, it doesn't have to be perfect. Steampunk is a style that is not supposed to be new. It hasn't just came out of the factory. It's supposed to be look old. And there's another way of doing it. We have iron works, rust effects, and paint. Now, this specific project is it's been done out of cast iron. Obviously, this requires a lot more technique. You need the proper tools to smelt iron, the, the templates. This is a bit of an extreme case. Um, but for example, again, to make it old, this person has just used simple inks and simple paints to give a rust effect, but not a rust like you would find on, I don't know, on a Fallout theme project, for example. It's something subtle, something that just says, this has been used for 50 years, and it sometimes has been left alone and hasn't been maintained, but the whole, the whole beauty of steampunk is that it just keeps on working. We can use copper, plexiglass, and brass. Obviously, in, steam, in, in a steampunk uh, world, they wouldn't have plexiglass. Those are plastics. Polymers don't exist there. But it imitates uh, glass very well. And the good thing about plexiglass is that if you, if you can't find the right container or the right thing you want to do, it's, you, can, it, you can manipulate it with, it with the heat. It just bends. So it, with a bit of practice, you can do anything from tubes to uh, reservoirs for liquid cooling to little details, that kind of thing. Copper is very important. If you, if you, you won't find a steampunk project, be it a computer or anything without copper or some form of imitation or painted brass, something like that. In this case, we see pipes, which are being created with, with brass uh, brackets. And basically, it, it, it just adds to the whole look. I mean, if you would see this without the, without the copper, it, it would look completely different. Now, in general, certain materials within the steampunk gen, be it one style or another, there's always something in common. There's always the same materials. Most of the changes are aesthetical and paint-wise. So we have brass. Brass is very cheap nowadays. Uh, you can also use pewter and paint it. Unfortunately, pewter is, is not as easy to find in large quantities. The thing with brass is that if you, you don't actually need an industrial smelter at home to do it yourself, you can actually buy these small kits so with the right protection because it can be toxic. You can, smel you can smelt it into a shape, into a bar, whatever you need. And the good thing about it is that it's actually quite, um, quite soft as well. So you can actually bash it into place, you can make whatever you want with it. You would also find most details um, that, you, that you want to add to your, to your project, be it small watches, small, de uh, small hinges. They will normally come made in brass as well. This helps as well because the actual color is very easy to imitate. And if we, if, if we make a mistake with the, with the painting over it, that's all brass color. You can actually find paints which, which will match it exactly. It's not like copper, which has varying tones. Copper, obviously. Um, copper nowadays is not used as much because it's become quite expensive. But again, it's easy to, to smelt if you want to go that way. It's easy to, to work with. And it's, in terms of steampunk, it's mostly used for liquid cooling, to actually move the cooling through it. 
as I was mentioning before, the, the wood is very important that you have this, this aged look, something vintage, something that you would find on 1930 radio. Ideally, you want to use real wood, but it, it is a pain, so I would always recommend use vinyl, and I will explain later on how to, how to make it look, how to give it that old feeling. Now, this one is always a funny one. Nobody believes me when I tell them this. To actually give an old look to, to copper and to brass, the best thing you can use is not paint, it's shoe polish. If you can get it in liquid form, the way it works, you put a bit on a, on a brush. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it, but it's a, it's a painting technique called a dry brush. What you do is you, you get some paint on your brush, you basically wipe it out with kitchen towel, and natural remnants, you need to go like that on the surface. This will give you very uneven color tones, but it will actually make it look real. Because really when you have old wood, when you have old copper, you will never get a, a whole surface which is, the, which is the right color. Because if it's different part of the surface, it's, it's been exposed to different materials, different circumstances, so you will never get the same. So that gives you the perfect, the perfect look. And of course, shoe polish you can find anywhere. When you're going to paints, it's very important that you use acrylic based paints and not synthetic or plastic. This is simple, it's because if, uh, if you want to paint more surfaces, and a plastic or synthetic paint will actually give you a solid coat. This is really bad for cooling because you won't actually let the, the air out, the actual heat out of, the, out, of the, out of your case. And also the fact that acrylic paint will last you a lot longer. It won't peel off uh, once you lacquer it, and it's actually quite cheaper as well. If you're feeling more tricky and more advanced, or if you have some painting skills already, inks are the best way to go. Um, you can actually change the whole look of a whole project, the whole feel of it, with just a few coats of very thin, very watered down ink. It will, even, it will further that age and vintage look. Vinyl, as I mentioned before, comes in many forms. You can actually, it's normally meant for, uh, uh, for the floors, like the picture here, or for walls. And the wine picture here is not ideal because you can see it's very thick and it's sectioned already. Normally you will find rolls of the stuff, a bit like a wallpaper, but it, it will always be ad adhesive, so you just have to peel it off, pull it on, and then cut the trim and so on. Uh, this is always the most important factor. Once we decide we want to do this kind of project, we have to plan according to the skills. We can't think, all right, I've seen this on Bioshock, or I've seen this in a movie, and I, I just really want to do it. I mean, it's all good and fun, but if you get down to it and your skills are not up to it, then you're going to get to a point where you're going to get frustrated and you're going to throw it out the window. That's not help anyone. So the first thing you should have in mind is if you're going to do a, a paint effect, so if you're going to do um, age effects, you should practice on discarded parts. It's important that you practice on a part that's the same material as the one you're going to be doing the final project on. This is because serial materials will react differently to di different processes. So basically, if you try it on a piece of metal, what you later on going to try on a piece of wood, it probably won't come out the same way. All right, this applies to pretty much everything, measure, measure, and triple measure. With this kind of thing, I said before, there's no going back. Once you've cut wood, once you've cut uh, metal sheets, once you've applied effects, if you then realize that you've got the measures wrong, you're going to have to redo the whole part again. One of the biggest problems with steampunk is the, the fact that um, I suppose I start a project will think, okay, I can add uh, little clock watches here, I can add cogs here, I can have mechanical parts over there, I can have that over there. When you start doing it, uh, you might find that you don't find a part that you need, that you, don't, uh, that you grow out of a specific design idea, and in the end, you will find your project is always, you get that feeling it's always missing something. You'll start adding things for the sake of adding. And while in, that is actually a big part of steampunk, it's not the great idea to do here. So it's very important to, before you start, you don't necessarily have to draw it, but just have a very clear idea of what you want, what you want out of this project, if you're going to be able to do it, if you're going to be able to source the materials. So by the time you finish it, you will feel a sense of accomplishment because it's exactly how you envisioned it, because you actually took the time to plan it. Right, too many details in the sense of adding um, objects that you may find on shops and think, okay, this will, go look, this will look good on my project. Problem with this is that by the time you put them all on, as I was mentioning before, if you feel that further down the road that you know, you're walking down the street and you see in a shop a little, did, a little uh, accessory that you would think, oh, that would look great on my project. If you've already done it a lot, it, it prevents you from improvising. And again, you may finish a project and think, 
hey, it could have looked a lot better if I didn't add all this stuff on. Now, this is, the, this is probably the question I most get asked. Because Steampunk is all about the details and overcrowding, essentially making it over the top, a lot of people ask, well, what does that do? Does it make my computer go faster? Does, does it make it cooler? So we, we always constantly have this, this concept about having an average level between functionality and design. Adding too much stuff that has no function, while it may look great, and have in mind that, again, it may affect the airflow, it may affect the cooling, especially if you're running a high-end computer. And that kind of thing you don't want, even if it's just for aesthetics. People use the excuse that, hey, I'm just taking it for a lamp party, this is a showpiece, that's all good. But at the end of the day, you have to think that this is not a painting, this is not a sculpture, this is an actual computer. And whether you just use it in lamp parties, you want to you make the most out of it. In terms of accessories and working parts, in this picture you can see it got a valve pressure. The actual liquid cooling is going through the copper pipes. You see the pump there. Now you could, actually, you could put any, any pressure measure there and it would look good. But when you're starting on, if you don't see the whole thing moving, it, kind of looks, it looks a bit fake. So it's very important that you, that you when, on your planning phase, when you're deciding what's going to go in, there's certain things you can buy that are not specifically meant for that. For example, that's a plumbing part. You have, to have, you have to think how you can implement them in a working way, how you can make it look work, how you can make people think that really that inside is just a bunch of cogs and clockwork, and it's somehow outputting an image on your screen. The whole magic behind it. If you get moving parts, if you get something that actually works properly, then it will, it will add a lot to the illusion. Water cooling nowadays has become a big part of, of computers, uh, mostly because as high-end comes out, high-end hardware comes out, it, create, it generates a lot of heat. We demand more power, we get more heat out of it. The problem with that is that it's, it's spreading to the mainstream because the, the high-end hardware that before was the exclusive now is the mid-end hardware, but that hardware still heats up. So then you get, now we get in the market all these uh, preset liquid cooling kits that you don't have to do anything about it. It's just like changing a fan. You put them in and then you go. Now on Steampunk, the, the, we've seen this recently, that a lot of people are adding liquid cooling to it. In this case, for example, we see two radiators, which are fanless, with a whole copper system going around. Now normally in a radiator, you wouldn't, you wouldn't not put fans, because then you wouldn't cool it down. But in this sense, the whole copper thing creates an, uh, creates an actual um, cooling effect, and a, a heat sink effect. So again, this is a perfect mixture of design and functionality. It looks the part and it actually acts the part as well. One of the most famous mods you can, most people do is keyboard, mice, small accessories. Now, personally I think this was fantastic, but really, would you imagine yourself at home trying to type some university work, some coursework, something like this? It's not really the most practical keyboard in the world. It's even mice that are not practical as well. Again, we go back to the whole, it's for a LAN party, it's for show and tell, whatever. You don't have to sacrifice the usability for the sake of making it look pretty. I want to talk to you guys now about variations in Steampunk. As I, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's no a set style for Steampunk. It's, it's, it's a lot of mixtures put together. So there is a few recognized variations I'm going to talk to you through. The thing specific, I was talking before about Bioshock. This, for example, is a Bioshock theme mod. Now, this specific uh, style mixes a lot of the steampunk features, but it also mixes some retrofuturistic stuff, um, some, <coughs> excuse me, some 1950s concepts, stuff like that. In this case, for example, it, it's all working parts. You see the bulb in the front, you see the lights in the, at the top. Then you get post-apocalyptic. This is a mixture of, uh, of stuff like Fallout, stuff like Mad Max, it's anything that's a desert world, uh, after nuclear war, warfare, that kind of concept. Now, if you bring that to the whole steampunk here and you mix it with that, we get the whole steampunk look, but adding a lot more age effects, a lot more rust. In this case, for example, the actual panel, you can see it's supposed to be originally copper, and over the, the concept of being a hundred years, it's rusted away. So the, you see the whole white and turkey sprites coming out, which is what you get when copper rust. And the wood, for example, 
it almost looks rotten. It looks like it's been exposed to the to the to the outside for hundreds of years. So in this case, it's a lot more important. The detail is a lot more important. And for example, this specific kind, I wouldn't recommend to any beginner. Well, mo because free and frankly, it is a pain in the ass, and you don't want to start with this. Look at classic. This is the this is the main concept of most people of steampunk. We see the whole Victorian effect. We see the whole flowery thing going on there. We see the keyboard a, a bit like a mechanical keyboard. Even the screen has been modified to look like a, well, like a painting, really. This is, this is the main general concept. This is quite hard to do because it, it's very unforgiving. Unlike the other styles, where you may go wrong in, a bit thing, uh, in, wrong in a big corner or wrong over there, and you can just say it's part of the style. On this, this kind of mod tends to be very clean. This is the kind of steampunk that looks like it literally has just come out of the workshop. So any, in, any imperfection, any wrong detail will look bad on it. As you can see, for example, the actual stand is completely poly on the wood. The actual keyboard is, is impeccable, the screen is impeccable. So again, this is a very hard style to do properly. Let me get tech-based. The difference between this and the other ones is that this kind of project tend to be very big, specifically because they're trying to emulate the workings behind it. In this case, you have the, you have the steam engine over there, you have the pipes coming out of there, and it, it will, you have the cogs everywhere. The whole point of it is to give you an idea that it's an actual machine behind it, it's an actual hardware behind it. Some people will even go as far as to record industry sounds, cog and machinery work, just to give you that feeling that it really is. You really are in a Victorian era, and that really is working, just as it looks like it's working. I mean, I've got a pretty recent one. It's called Retrofuturistic. Um, we, there is a, a, a design called Retrofuturistic, but when it applies to steampunk, we get parts of that design. So we start seeing different alloys, a bit like if the whole industrial era had discovered aluminum a bit earlier. So we see different alloys, but we see they're not preferred. They're, they're, a, bit, they're a bit raw we see the whole attempt to try and look into the, what the future design would like. A bit like what 1950 would think nowadays would be like with flying cars or flying skateboards and stuff like that. This is the kind of thing, this is, an, this is probably the, the hardest design to do. Mostly because there's not really that many examples, there's not a specific set of do's and don'ts. So it's a bit like winging it, you have to do it and then judge for yourself whether it looks the part or not. I find personally this one very interesting, I've never attended anything myself. But the problem with this kind of design is that it normally requires a lot more machinery work. If you have CNC's uh, or if you have to like to work with where you can find one, you could easily attempt this because it's all like 3D design, printing out and or basically doing it. In terms of, uh, of paint, as you can see, there's not much paint. This is mostly depending on materials looks. But this is probably what steampunk in terms of modern will eventually evolve to. To finish with, I'm going to get you to the same thing I told you everyone. Steampunk can be very hard and it can be very easy. The main difference between steampunk in modding and any other style is that you're going to make mistakes whether you're 100 years experience or zero and you've got to be patient. You've got to put every single stroke in detail. Take, it, take your time. If you don't feel like doing more today, stop. Just do it another day when you feel like it. Because it is that kind of project where if you don't really truly feel like it, if you don't really want to do it, then you're going to make mistakes because you're going to try and rush it. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the explanation of what Steampunk and Modern is. Um, are we going to round to the Q&A questions? Someone's supposed to manage the Q&A? Yeah, there you go. Is there any questions? Really? Okay, so I guess I can ask anybody of you about Steampunk modding. Yeah, well, well, I'm not a uni teacher, so that's okay. Ah, right, well, thank you guys for coming. And that's it. Cheers.